Hello, and welcome to another episode of uh, 5 and 15. Uh, 5 and 15 is part of uh, um, uh, one of the initiatives that the Critical Ottoman and Post-Ottoman Studies Initiative at the Ainaudi Center is trying to do. Part of what we try to do with these uh, short uh, um, uh, interviews, basically uh, five questions in 15 minutes, is get to know scholars that are doing um, exciting work, basically people you need to know if you're interested in the region. Today, uh, we are lucky to have a PhD candidate here at Cornell University who's doing very exciting work, and I think you would like to meet him as well. His name is Ziad El Nabulsi. He's a PhD candidate uh, at the Africana Department. Welcome, Ziad. Uh, Ziad, I'm going to ask you five set questions. Uh, these are the same questions that I ask everybody as a way of kind of making it uniform. Uh, we're hoping to get through this in 15 minutes. That is the deal. Um, so um, I'm going to start with the first question. So <clears throat> Ziad, who are you? How do you define yourself as a scholar and a person? And how does that impact your work? A very big question. Uh, yeah, yeah. Th thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. So uh, let me try to uh, give a fairly concise answer. So um, in terms of who, who I am and, and uh, uh, personal personal aspects of my life that might have influenced, you know, what, what I've chosen to study. So um, um, so I was born and raised in, in, uh, in uh, Cairo. Uh, uh, of uh, partial Palestinian descent, but uh, immigrated to Canada, you know, when I was 15 and so on. And so um, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but like a lot of, uh, you know, uh, Arab kids migrating are supposed to be an engineer. So uh, <laughs> I, I studied uh, engineering in university, but I always had an interest in, uh, in the humanities. Uh, uh, and so, uh, in terms of my current work, what I look at is uh, one way to look at it is to say uh, the reception of modern science in, uh, in North Africa and West Africa in the 19th century from a comparative perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose to this extent, I still do have that interest in science, but also uh, adding, if you like, the, the humanities component, so a kind of history and philosophy of, of science. And in terms of that line of work, one of my... Uh, primary motivations is to uh, think of the connection between, say, let's say, uh, parts of the Arabic speaking world or Arab world, however people wish to refer to it, and uh, the, the rest of the African continent, specifically if we're talking about North Africa. So I'm interested in showing similarities, differences between, say, developments in Egypt in the 19th century with respect to you know, the uh, project of modernization and similar developments in Sierra Leone. So I look at that uh, through two figures, uh, Rifat Tahtawi and Afrikanus Horton, who are rough contemporaries, uh, more or less. Um, yeah, and, and, cool. and, yeah, and, and if, if you look at a lot of uh, surveys of African intellectual history in the 19th century, just generally speaking, uh, for the most part, uh, the history of the intellectual history of North Africa gets written out of it. And in part, of course, this is a response to the manner in which uh, we can say that uh, North African intellectual history has been uh, assimilated to a kind of Middle East, a bigger uh, umbrella, Middle East intellectual history or Middle Eastern intellectual history. Uh, so I, I just attempt to challenge that. To to to, uh, to the extent that I can, uh, and it's not it's not just I think out of you know uh, uh, political motivations, but also I think scholarly motivations. I think I think uh, if if we miss, for example, the connections between West and North Africa in the nineteenth century, we just don't get an adequate picture of what's going on. Absolutely, I cannot agree more. You know, I'm a bit biased about this topic because it's something that is. Uh, dear to my heart. And by the way, I was also uh, an undergrad civil engineer. <laughs> so same, same uh, university, same I think, story. right? Same, you know, yes, indeed. McMaster. Yeah, yeah. Indeed, indeed. I think we have similar trajectory. I actually had no idea. <laughs> um, so let me ask you the second question. Uh, what is your project? You told us a little bit about it, but can you tell us a, a little more about <clears throat> what is the main idea? Um, uh, basically, what is your argument or what is your argument to the extent that you can tell us at this point? Yes, yes, of course. Um, so uh, 
one one claim or the central claim actually let's put it this way that i wish to make is that uh, despite what is often said um, uh, the the introduction of modern science to the african continent was not actually uh, a part of the colonial process in the sense that in my view it precedes it especially if you're for example to look at this example of west africa what we see is sort of uh, people from <clears throat> people who we can say are members of sort of a, a Western educated elite, you know, the, the, the children of the captives as they grew up in the 19th century and on, uh, onwards, uh, actually attempted to sort of create indigenous uh, modern educational institutions, and they were sort of consistently thwarted by colonial authorities uh, because, <clears throat> because I, I think there was just this idea that uh, uh, again, informed by the scientific racism, which becomes predominant from the, say, like mid 19th century onwards, there is this idea that, okay, you people don't even need this kind of education anyway. So, so uh, why would we expend uh, money on it and all of that? <clears throat> but for me, what's interesting is that a lot of uh, surveys or, or uh, historical accounts of, of science on the African continent as a whole, and here I'm going to generalize a bit, they make the assumption that. If you're writing the history of uh, 19th century science on the West, uh, on the African continent, you're basically writing the history of colonial science. Uh, so I look at a period before the scramble for Africa, so before the late 19th century. So I'm looking at maybe I look at uh, material from, say, the 1820s to, let's say, like the 1870s. Now, of course, <clears throat> uh, Sierra Leone at that time is still a British colony, but the colonial the colonial sort of context is quite different from what it becomes later on uh, 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 after the scramble for Africa. So basically, I'm sort of looking at these two cases of Rafat Tahtawi and Africanus Horton as people who, uh, independently of any kind of colonial project, of course, they're responding to the global developments, this is natural, but independently of any kind of colonial project are trying to assimilate some of these modern sciences as a kind of, you know, as a, as a significant element in a project of modernization. Uh, basically, that, that would be a, a summary of, of my main contention. Very cool. Thank you. So, how did you do it? What were what are the sources of material that you're actually working with? Basically, archival material. Because I'm, I'm talking mm -hmm. from a historical perspective, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, what sources are you using? Yeah. So uh, my primary sources are so, so both of those people, Rafat Tahtawi and uh, Africanus Horton, are published authors, and we do have, especially for Rafat Tahtawi, as you know, obviously he's sort of. Uh, uh, a very significant figure in, in the Nahda movement. So there is a lot of research on him. There are critical editions of his work in Arabic and so on. <clears throat> so uh, to, to, to this extent, I obviously draw on this published material, uh, primary, uh, uh, primary texts. Uh, Africanus Horton also published around maybe uh, six or, or seven books, depends on how, how you, uh, what you consider a book. So again, those are accessible. Some of them have been reprinted. Two of them have been reprinted recently. Uh, in terms of ar archival research, so um, I've been trying to sort of understand the intellectual context, uh, specifically of uh, Africanus Horton more, because compared to Tahtawi, there isn't much work on Africanus Horton. Uh, in fact, I think it's not an overstatement to say that in terms of uh, work on him. There is basically one one book in English by Christopher Pfeiffer. Uh, you know, maybe five articles in English and two in German, and that that basically exhausts it. So I've had to do more archival research. So over over the winter break, for instance, I've uh, been working in the National Archives in London <clears throat> and King's College, where he studied in order to to understand okay what kind of material could he have read, who were his interlocutors, who was he arguing against. Mm -hmm. um, and what more, one fascinating thing about Horton is that he's actually one of the first critics uh, of uh, scientific racism as it developed in the 19th century, because he's yeah. trained as a doctor and mm -hmm. he's an anatomist. So he takes sort of these anatomical claims and, uh, and basically demolishes them. Uh, uh, I mean, one way to think of it is that he's saying, you know, uh, 
the kind of race science which was propagated by people uh, associated with the Anthropological Society of, uh, of London is basically bad science, or to put it more strongly, even pseudoscience. And this is in the mid 19th century. So, so it's a precursor to, to some yeah, later. Pretty early, yeah. Aspect. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. fascinating. Have you been able to do any archival research in either Cairo or in Sierra Leone? Uh, no, I mean, so. I'm planning perhaps Cairo, perhaps in the summer. Uh, and I know some people who do work on similar, similar things in Egypt, so, so perhaps this would not be so difficult. Uh, and with respect to Sierra Leone, I mean, one issue is that because, uh, strictly speaking, Africanus Horton, uh, James, uh, James Africanus Horton was uh, an employee of the British Army. So to give maybe perhaps to give more context, uh, um, he, he sort of gets recruited uh, as a medical student as a response basically to the, to, uh, to the attrition of uh, British white British medical officers who were stationed in, in West Africa. Mm -hmm. So basically uh, uh, the commanding the commanding uh, uh, officers real uh, you know claimed okay look, we can't have all of our doctors die every six months. Uh, so what we should do, and there was this idea that, you know, uh, uh, Black West Africans are kind of seasoned or acclimatized to, to, to uh, climate in West Africa so that they would not uh, suffer th the same high mortality rate. So they said, we'll start recruiting uh, Black doctors. Uh, and again, so this is the period just before, uh, just before, uh, scientific Darwinism or racially, uh, sorry, excuse me, racially inflected social Darwinism takes over. So it's still kind of acceptable that you can have uh, 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 Black West Africans go to London to train to be medical doctors, serve in the British army. So, uh, I mean, the, 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 the whole point here is that most of his records are in London because- Got it, got yeah. it. Uh, there is some stuff in, in, in Freetown, but it's, uh, I think, his will primarily and some other material. How do you see your work impacting your field? What is, how would you define your field? Because you're, uh, you're in Africana studies, so maybe that, that's where we should start. So how do you see the work uh, kind of impacting your field and really kind of uh, the, 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 our, our perspective uh, at large, whether it is within mm -hmm. your field or outside of it? Right. So, so in terms of, uh, yeah, so in terms of the field of Africana studies, as you know, it's sort of a very broad field. Yeah. Uh, and it, uh, um, I suppose it's thematic rather than disciplinary mm -hmm. in its orientation. Uh, but if I were to place myself uh, in, in, uh, in a kind of disciplinary perspective, I'd say perhaps the closest would be something like intellectual history, mm -hmm. uh, kind of writ large. Um, and to this extent, I mean, I'd say my main interlocutors are uh, people who have written on African intellectual history, people who have written on history of science on the African continent, uh, but also social and cultural historians as well. Um, and in terms of impact, I mean, ideally, I, I would, I would uh, like this to sort of do two things. Uh, help us understand the manner in which, for example, we can think comparatively about developments in Egypt and, and the 19th century and developments in Sierra Leone. Because again, mm -hmm. there's this idea that the two are so different that they cannot be compared. And one of the, the things I'm arguing for is that actually have very similar developments at around the same period of time, obviously, perhaps right. at a different scale, of course, different scale and so on. Um, <clears throat> but for me, I, I would think it would be positive if uh, it becomes normal, even if someone doesn't accept my analysis, but on, uh, if, if it becomes normal to think about these issues comparatively and to sort of situate Egypt in 19th century African history, especially intellectual history. Um, and so to this extent, I think maybe uh, expanding the scope of the field would be something that uh, I'd be you know interested in, in uh, and, and sort of contributing to, even in a very small way. Uh, the other part, like I said, is, uh, is perhaps more directed to people who work on history of science on the African continent, because uh, in my view, I think it's, uh, it's, it's too simplistic to think of 19th century uh, science on the African continent as colonial science. That would be sort of yeah. one, one preconception, which I wish to challenge.
Wonderful. Okay. Very cool. Very important. So um, I don't know. This is I don't know if you can answer this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. It's part of the five. So you're in the middle of of uh, working on this dissertation, but uh, you must have some ideas about what's next for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what's yeah, next? I I mean yeah I I mean so uh, there are a few things sort of I guess I I don't know if next sort of sequentially uh, if they're kind of in sequence but sort of side projects that I'm working on. Um, so I've uh, I've taken a really strong interest in uh, in the history of uh, Marxism in East Africa. So mm -hmm. that that's something I've been working on. I've uh, and hopefully in. in in April, a couple of chapters will come out, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, it will come out where? Uh, so there is a, a volume edited uh, on the legacy of Lenin. Sorry, I'm trying to remember uh, the publisher. It's Sunni Press. It's edited okay, cool. by uh, Ala Ivanchukova and Robert McLean. So uh, mm -hmm. I have a chapter on, there on sort of uh, the legacy of Lenin in East Africa. This is something I'm interested in. Uh, <clears throat> and then there is... Uh, uh, another volume, which actually I think it won't come out this uh, this spring, but perhaps either the fall or the spring after. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's called African Marxism in the 1970s, where again I sort of talk about uh, the the so-called Dar es Salaam debates in the 1970s. So this is a project I'm really interested in. Um, the other the other project I'm also interested in is looking at. Uh, the history of African studies in Egypt. So I've been working a bit on uh, that history and looking at uh, what we can see were marginalized voices, so Helmi Sha'arawi, uh, and people have worked on Helmi Sha'arawi recently, so Reem Abul Fadl, uh, I believe she has an article on Helmi Sha'arawi, and she's in the process of translating his autobiography, which is a fascinating, uh, I, I think, a book for anyone who can read Arabic now and is interested in, in sort of uh, understanding relations between Egypt and other African countries. I think it's a fascinating book. Um, yes, so uh, the other project, yeah, is uh, on Helmi Sharaw. No, that's that's a lot. And I think all of these are really, really important pro uh, projects. And I'm talking about this from the perspective of someone who works in Southwest Asia uh -huh. um, and uh, works on a relationship between Southwest Asia and, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we need so much more on this. So, um, of course, yeah. Uh, so I'm glad you're working on this. I'm glad a lot. I'm, we're going to be interviewing other students that are working on on similar topics in the coming weeks. So, um, Ziad, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, it's uh, it was really interesting for me to learn more about what you're doing. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much for uh, the generous invitation and for the uh, stimulating questions. I really enjoyed it. Thank you.